Hi, and welcome back to AP Human Geography with Dustin Fowler. Today we're going to talk about some of the most basic stuff dealing with AP Human Geography. The basic concepts. We're going to look a little bit more at location, a little bit at maps, and in spatial analysis. We're going to talk about the difference between geography as an overarching subject and human geography. We're going to look at some of the ancient geographers like Eratosthenes, Aristotle, and Ptolemy. And then we're going to go on eventually in this series to discuss things dealing with environmental determinism, possibilism, diffusion, and all that good stuff. Stay tuned, let's learn about AP Human Geography. For starters, the subject of geography is, it's always thought, literally. I mean, if you were thinking anything and you went outside and you, were, and you were thinking, you were probably thinking about the earth and something around you in the, the, in the space and how you're going to use it. If you're a caveman, you were probably thinking about how you're going to go about organizing your cave. Where are you going to put your cave painting? Where are you going to put your rock that you sit on? Um, these are all different things that really help us to know that geography is truly as old as thought. But it didn't really become a discipline of study until maybe the Greeks got a hold of it. For example, your first real geographer was a dude named Eratosthenes, who was a Greek philosopher and, and, uh, and geographer, who was first to really coin the word and the phrase geography. In fact, my boy Eratosthenes was smart enough that he was able to calculate with relatively extreme accuracy the circumference of the Earth. I'm not sure how he did that. I can't just walk outside and figure out math like that. But this guy was a genius and he was able to do this. All right, so if he's measuring circumference, this also means that people at that time were pretty sure that the Earth was spherical. Aristotle, who was also the, uh, a geographer and teacher, tutor of Alexander the Great, was all about the um, learning of geography, understanding the physical environment, understanding the world in which you live. In fact, many people uh, kind of attribute the knowledge that Alexander had of the Earth and how to use it to his teachings by Aristotle, his tutor. Not only did Aristotle know that the world was in fact spherical, but he also kind of understood the idea that stuff kind of drew itself towards a center. Almost like he was kind of thinking about gravity almost. It was pretty impressive some of the things these philosophers were able to think up just from raw observation. But really when you think about it, it's not too too hard to realize that the Earth might be spherical, even though they would have thought it was it was the center. Uh, Ptolemy was this mastermind of the geocentric theory, and he was wrong, but but you know, it makes sense. Nonetheless, it kind of makes sense when you look up into, at the moon, the stars, and everything else is a sphere. Aristotle would not have been the first to have seen an eclipse of the Earth uh, as it crosses uh, over the moon or blocks the, the sun to the moon, but he would have noticed that it was spherical, and that would have led him to believe that, in fact, the Earth itself would have had to have been a sphere. Later on, Eratosthenes discovered its circumference, as I mentioned just a while ago. Ptolemy was also really, really important in the field of geography, as he was big into maps. He created a, 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 a several volume book, The Guide to Geography, in which he created maps and was kind of involved in map making. Unfortunately, mapping wouldn't become a big thing again in the human world up until uh, the age of, of, of exploration, you know, during the time that the Portuguese and the Spanish and all that started to do the exploring in Africa and the Americas. So what exactly is human geography and how is it different from regular geography? Well, it's important to know that geography is a huge, super broad subject that encompasses all sorts of other social sciences and physical sciences and you name it. I mean, it can be applied to geography in some form or fashion. And so when you think about geography, most of the time we think about it in terms of, well, um, what we might learn about in elementary school as the definition thereof. Mr. Fowler, geography is the study of the earth and everything in it. Oh, no crap. And The Hunger Games is about a story of a girl, right? You see how that definition leaves a lot out? Just like we know that The Hunger Games is way more than just a story of a girl, geography is way more than just the study of the earth and everything in it. Yes, that is true, but what exactly, what specifically, and what even on a more broad scale is geography? The Oxford Dictionaries defines geography as the study of the physical features of the Earth and its atmosphere, and of human activity as it affects and is affected by these, including the distribution of populations and resources, land use, and industries. Great. So if that's what geography is, and I don't think anyone's going to really argue about that, and you will see a lot of different ways to basically say the same thing about what geography actually is, um, what exactly would human geography be then? If you take out the physical components of that definition, and you just look at the people and the patterns that they, ha that they have, and the way that they interact with the Earth, 
then you're looking a little bit more closely at what human geography actually is. It's a study of us and the environment. It's a study of how we collectively own the earth, and how we work together to live on it together and share everything that's in it. Today, with seven billion people on earth, actually more like almost seven and a half, uh, it's more important than ever before that we figure out a way to do this. One of the ways that we try really hard to make sense of the earth around us is by mapping it out. We've always kind of had a, a, a fetish with taking a, a, a projection or a piece of the earth and putting it onto a map in some form or fashion. One of the first examples of this in human history is the Babylonian tablets that include what they would have considered to be the known world at the time. And you can tell it's a map, right? In the same way that we kind of can draw on a whiteboard uh, uh, what our mental maps might would be, when you know, our path uh, to school or our path um, to work or whatever it might be, these people were pretty good at understanding their geography in the sense that they understand what they do on a daily basis or even on a year-to-year -year basis or um, dealing with migratory practices or whatnot. Maps are oftentimes used to explain location and when we think about geography, the first thing we think about typically is the location of stuff, right? We think about states, we think about capitals, we think about countries and places and religions and where they're located, right? And so in the same sense, mapping is used to explain location, but it's also used to explain human phenomena today. For example, we can figure out where religions are located. We might understand uh, how people migrate from one place to another. We might understand um, air traffic patterns, or I just recently saw a map that shows the different types of communication uh, uh, among Twitter. You know, so you see where uh, where different topics are being discussed in different places on a regional and a global scale. Maps today have so much more practical use than they ever have before. We're able to do more with them than we ever have been able to before. So when we think about what maps are, it is important to understand scale of maps. At its most basic level, you want to know what it is you're looking at, and when it comes to determining um, the amount of space that is shown on a map, uh, scale is pretty important because you can either, you, we've always seen these little lines that say this much space equals however many miles on Earth. That's an example of one of the three different types of scale that we're going to see anytime we look at a map. All right, why is, that is actually what we call a graphical map. And you also have written scales, um, and you've also got uh, uh, fractional or ratio scales. One inch on this map might represent uh, a mile on the world's surface, or a lot of times you see this one. One inch on this map represents 24,000 miles on the Earth's surface. A written scale is just like what it sounds like. Uh, it would be just written out, a sentence that says, one inch on this map might represent 1,000 miles on the Earth's surface. Pretty simple, right? And so those are the three different types of scales you're going to see to explain the spatial components of a map, all right? How much distance you're looking at in a map projection. But scale can also be, in geography, uh, the concepts of, of, of widespread and small scale, okay? So you might have something happens on a global scale and something happens on a local scale. And the funny thing about this is that we are impacted by both the local and the global. And here's the proof of this. This summer, a dude shot up a church in Charleston, South Carolina. I happen to be from South Carolina, and I also happen to have gone to one of the schools that this crazy guy had gone to. And so when you think about the importance of that on a local scale, I'm all in the local here. I'm seeing it from the standpoint of the, uh, the basically the same community as a state um, and some of the local cities here. We feel very, very in touch with what's going on because it's very close by. But then also, you've got people in other parts of the country that are talking about what happened. You also have people in the other parts of the world, on other continents, that are very familiar with this guy shooting up that church and with the racial tension that this has caused in our state and our country. And so you can see right there how the local has impacted the global. On the other hand, you have ISIS in the Middle East. Now, we're not living in the Middle East, all right? We don't really, do we, do we, should we care about it? Absolutely. Why? Because it's happening on a global scale, but we are involved in that. We're involved with the countries that are trying to deal with it. We're, um, it's, it's, you, you watch the debates on, on uh, the other day, the Republican uh, primary debates, and you talk about how it's become one of the front issues uh, that, they're, that they have to discuss. And these politicians have to have a plan on how to deal with ISIS and how to deal with foreign affairs, Russia, China. Um, uh, all these things are really important to the United States and they're global issues that affect us on a local level. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about how that might happen. 
using terms like globalization and localization, we're going to learn a little bit about how the world is in the process of becoming exactly the same as other places on Earth, but while at the same time it's struggling to maintain its local uniqueness. This struggle, God only knows where it's going to go and what's going to happen as a result, good or bad. There is definitely some good and some bad with globalization. So this is what the topic of our next video is going to be. Thank you very much. If you liked the video, subscribe and stay tuned for more AP Human Geography lectures.